read with me Acts chapter 17, verse 6? It says, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Let's pray. Father, today I ask in the next few moments that you would turn us inside out, right side up, upside down. Help us to realize who you are, to love you for who you are, to learn from you, to love ourselves, and then beyond that, to love others in the same way that you've loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The early church says here that they were those who were known to have turned their world upside down. And really, you take a look at the early church and the church today, Holy Spirit's available. God still does signs and wonders. Hasn't stopped. We're still in the same dispensation of grace. Until Jesus returns for the millennial rule, that's a whole other topic. But right now we're in the same dispensation to preach the gospel. That all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And even though we've seen great victory in the past 2,000 years roughly, I think so many of us in the body of Christ would say, God, there's just, we want to see a move like we've never experienced. And we've seen revivals, we've seen flashes, we see things, but it, we want to see something that's just great before the return of the Lord. And the truth is, all this changed because God's part hasn't changed. Holy Spirit is the most important part. How many know that? Somebody say amen. amen. The second part, you and me. And may I suggest, they turned their world upside down because they allowed God to turn them upside down. And what I see in the culturalized American, westernized church is we really don't understand and behold Jesus properly. Oh, we accept some of his facets, as we'll mention as we move through this morning, but salvation, mercy, how I many know those are good gifts? But there's other things we leave out, and what we've done is we've turned God into this cheerleader, life coach. You can do it. God, God believes the best of you, and even though that in part is true, God knows you cannot do your best without him. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But through me, you can do all things. And so no matter what it is we accumulate in this life, Jesus said, to find your life, you need to lose it. If you find it, you've already lost it. He says you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. And even though most Christians are familiar with that passage of Scripture, we don't really live that way. And what we've turned the gospel into is that God just wants to meet all your needs. Well, that's absolutely true. But that's only part of what he wants to do. And understand something. If we just take a few scriptures and principles and live a life where we pursue our dreams and desires and just kind of put hashtag Jesus on it, we are missing out on the best gift of all, and that's a relationship with him. We talked about a couple of weeks ago how the disciples were so desperate when Jesus told them he'd be leaving. Their best friend, no one had ever been like Jesus, ever, ever has been, ever will be, and they were terrified. Because he said, okay, it's going to be better from here forward. We'll look at some of these scripture because he'd send the Holy Spirit. But honestly, they're paralyzed. They didn't know what to do. Because they were so used to being around Jesus, this friend, a friend who sticks closer than a brother, Jesus said it's better and more beneficial if I go away because I'll send the Holy Spirit. Do you know you and I have a better part of that same covenant because Jesus left? Amen. Because he rose from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father even now, this morning as we're standing here. And the Holy Spirit is there primarily not just to get us into heaven. See, the American church, well, I got to heaven. When's the rapture? Do you know how shallow we are? Listen. We just want to save our own skin. And listen, I hope the rapture happens before the tribulation gets really bad. But honestly, I don't live that way because I just don't know. I'll be honest with you. So, well, Pastor, you know all things. No, I don't. He does. <laughs> I don't know all things. All right. But the bottom lie, Bottom truth is we have turned Jesus into our image of what we think a successful life is, and that is not the gospel. 
and we've Americanized it completely. <coughs> Truth is that we are to behold Jesus in all his facets. Do you remember? Maybe that boyfriend or girlfriend in high school, or maybe even beyond that, the person you met that you wanted to spend the rest of your life with. Or maybe you're still looking for that, that spouse that you can live with. And under, I understand that's a great goal. It's a great gift. But that's all we think about. We meet that person, and man, we just cannot. I remember when I met my wife, Trish. We'll be married, uh, what is it, 36 years this May. It's amazing. And, and you know... It, it hasn't been that easy for me, but I've worked really hard. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you knew me, you'd know it's the other way around, but it's amazing. It's amazing. But I know, I remember when I first met her, I wanted to see her every day. Come on, you can relate. Back then, we didn't have texting and stuff. We just had regular landlines. Some of you remember that. I didn't know Jesus when we met. She married me anyway. Thank God, but we don't recommend that as a way of reaching people. I mean, God can work it, make it work, but it's not our number one recommendation, missionary dating or whatever you want to call it. But it worked. But I'd get home from the bar, which is all I ever did, go to the bar, hang out with my friends, drink way too much, drive on a driver's license that was suspended or taken away, I didn't care. Because that's where I wanted to be. And the truth is, I beheld that bar to a certain degree. My friends, those drinks. And we're talking about beholding. Because I beheld that, that was my favorite place to be. But you know what? Then I met Trish. And I still wanted that because I was bound. But I'd come home, and I'd call her, and you believe it or not, I'd give her a call. Some of you have heard parts of this story, but I have to. I can't help it. I'd give her a call on the landline, so drunk I'm half passing out, and she would read the Bible to me. And even though I didn't particularly have an interest in the Bible, oh, I wanted to spend time with her. Do you see where I'm going? I hope so. We have one greater, I have one greater in my life than Trish. Trish helped introduce him to me, then I'd pass out, and some of you remember this with the landlines. I'd be awakened by a... I'd have to hang it up. That meant she wasn't on the other end. But see, the truth is, if we really saw Jesus, listen, in all of his glory and beauty, rightly, and we'll look at some of that this morning, not just the God who answers my prayers, not just a genie with a lamp and we rub three times and get what we want. Sometimes God wants to show us things in our lives that are keeping us from having the life that he's prepared for us. But see, we don't want that, Jesus. Again, I'm not talking about earning your salvation or keeping your salvation, but we all have things in life that keep us living below the standard that God has for us. Hopefully you realize that. If not, then your issue is pride and you need help with that. So it's about beholding Jesus because that's the only way we're transformed. You become what you behold. In life, when you behold riches, wealth, fame, popularity, whatever it is, that's what you become. And when you don't reach it, you're upset. Your life is empty. And we'll do everything we can to get those needs met. But you know, even in all the needs, even all the good things, Jesus wants to come and say, there's still one thing. And that Jesus, we really don't love him. All we say we do, but this morning I'm going to suggest we don't. And I think that's the element that's missing in the church today. Is we're not willing to live the kind of life God wants us to, which means he is number one. Number one in our lives. And Trish and I have enjoyed a great 36 years of marriage. Not all perfect. Plenty of bumps and bruises. But one thing her and I have both realized 
as much as we love each other, we can't live without him. Because everything else in life is passing away. Everything else is only for a moment. It's here, then it's gone. But he's eternal. And so the only way we can become like him, because that's God's goal, is to get us to be like him. You remember the early church? We just read about how they turned the world upside down. Do you realize now we call ourselves Christians, and that's fine, but the first people to call Christians Christians were non-Christians? And what basically what they were saying in their language, these, they're just like Christ. <laughs> they're like Jesus. They recognize Jesus in them. My question is, does the world recognize Jesus in us? Oh, Jesus loved people. Jesus healed people. Jesus also challenged people. But there's never been anyone like him, never will be. It says in 2 Corinthians 3, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same, somebody say same, the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit, by the Spirit of the Lord. So basically what we look in a mirror and we see ourselves... <laughs> I'll be 65 in a couple of weeks. And when I look in there, I think, that, that 30-year-old guy is still in there somewhere. I say, Trish, can you see him? And she's like, yeah, honey, I see him. Well, you didn't even come down here. No. <laughs> you didn't come down and look in the mirror with me. But, and I know what you look like, and I love you. And, so <laughs> and you look, and you know... If you can just imagine, and then you see kind of this foggy appearance of Jesus. And he's kind of showing you areas that you don't look so much like. And come on, somebody. And he starts to say, you know, there's this little tweak right here. I can help you with that. But see, we don't really want to enter into that because what we want is what we want when we want it, and we want it now. And the truth is we really don't want him. I've said before, and I'll say till, till this life is over, the answer to your prayer is not the answer to your prayer. The answer to your prayer is Jesus. Because if Jesus truly was the center of everything, oh, we still have needs, we still have wants. Jesus said he knows that even before we ask. I'm not saying that. But even if we don't achieve those things or get those things, we do not cast off beholding him as in a mirror because we're so in love with him, we have to spend time with him. Any way we can, we carve out time to give him the best part of our day. So again, it's more than just trying to be like somebody. A parrot can impersonate me, but a parrot can never become me. Are you with me? Some people, you know, they say, well, if you read the King James Version only, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't run with those who do, ding, <laughs> then surely you'll get to heaven. Well, some of those things are not good for you, you know, that we try not to do. I believe that. Some of them the Bible says not to do. Others is open for conversation, but we like to judge, find some rules we can keep, and then judge everybody else according to those rules. That's not Christianity, but it's turned into that. The other side is, again, God's this self-help guru who just blesses our whole life and gives us everything we need. Well, even though that's true in part, we don't want the process to give us more than we think we need because what we think we need is far less than what he has for us. And the process, somebody say process, is what we don't want. And if we go through the process and don't cast off restraint, when things get really rough, we won't cast off restraint and we'll still have our relationship with him intact and we'll be able to hear his voice clearly. Is anybody hearing my voice this morning? Is anyone hearing the spirit of the Lord this morning? So the church, if things aren't going our way, we find another group of friends, we find another church, we find another preacher, we find another book until we accomplish everything we want, our heart's desire. And you can look at Jesus. We could stand in a service like today, and some of us here today, and I understand, maybe you're not used to a service like this. Like, how can they sing for 45 minutes? Well, around the throne room in heaven, they have been singing for all eternity and will not stop. The Bible talks about one time that there's a silent time in heaven. And that's when God gazes over the saints' prayers. 
But all other times you think, well, how many times are we going to sing that lyric? In heaven, they're only singing three words. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Okay, there's more. But <laughs> holy is the biggest part. All right. Because why? Because he is holy. Why? Because God likes hearing how holy he is. So, well, that's conceited. Thank you. Six. Six words. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> God loves to hear how holy he is. You say, well, that's kind of pri- prideful. Well, God's perfect, so it can't be. It's pride with us because none of us are perfect. Samuel Whitfield, authored, says this, God is very present in our everyday lives, and he loves to meet with us in our daily rhythms. And the truth is, can we just be honest, our daily rhythms are mundane and boring sometimes. Come on. We don't admit that. We certainly don't post it on Facebook. (laughs) But how many know, you know, sometimes it's like, Time to make the donuts. Somebody remember some of these commercials. This is a long time ago. I made the donuts. Commercial, the guy's going to make donuts at Dunkin' Donuts, and he's ready to go in the morning. Time to make the donuts. He drags in at night. I made the donuts, and at the end of the commercial, he runs into himself. I mean, no, life can be like, I just started, and it just ended, and I'm starting over. But those are the times God wants to move, and the problem is the church wants these grand encounters with God, which do happen. I, I, I believe any of us that have, have, have experienced God in some way that we have had opportunities for these divine encounters. I hope so. In some way. It might be something very miraculous that other people saw. It may be an inner witness or a way God came through, even in a small prayer, and you thought, I know that you have me covered because only he would know that, and it meant something to you. And those things are great, and they happen. They happen in the Bible, but even in the Bible, the men and women of God who had encounters with God that were glorious, even our modern-day preachers that God's using in a great way, we have encounters from time to time, but it's in the mundane days. Bill Johnson, some of you may have heard him before. Some of you may like him. Some of you may not like him. It really doesn't matter. I think he preaches uh, a lot of truth about the Word of God. And he was, said, he, he was quoted once as saying, you know, I don't remember what I read last Tuesday in my Bible. He believes as I do. Read the, just read the Bible. Say, well, I wasn't getting anything out of it. Read it anyway. You will. And the, and the thing is, it'll start to read you and you'll become like it because you're beholding in a mirror. But he said, I don't remember what I ate last, what I read last Tuesday. But I know it's good for me. And so said, well, how do you know that? He says, well, I don't remember what I ate for dinner last Tuesday, but I know it was good for me because it nourished me. See, there's sometimes, you know, you know <laughs> we can go to college and we can live on franks and beans. <laughs> Come on, somebody. But we think, well, whatever, Raymond noodles, yeah. And then, boy, when it was a special night, you had the hot dogs, beans, and Raymond. Living high in a hog, y'all. All All right. (laughs) But the truth is we get bored with Jesus, and I believe in a large part the church in America and Western culture, listen, is bored with Jesus. We sang this morning, and again, I, I know that it's a long service for some of us, and I understand that. So they say, well, I don't want to stand. Then sit down. I sit down. So when I'm not up here playing or singing or whatever, I'll sit down. It's okay. It's all right. God, God's way bigger than that. And if you think, well, what would other people think? It doesn't matter. You're not here for them. We're here for him. And we're here to grow and be taught by him. I get that. You'll find out this morning, though, that through the preaching of the word and singing psalms, that we actually grow because we behold him. And I'll, I'll give you some scripture on that. But the truth is we don't want to linger in the presence of God. Sometimes, at least in our church and many others, we may just like to have some silence. Just kind of stay there. We're just going to... You save me. You save me. I couldn't get that that song off my heart and went over to our son, Tony, our worship leader, and I said, he had another song planned. I said, could you sing You Save Me? Could you do that out of this song? He said, no. <laughs> and I said, oh. So I just stood here. And I'm like, 
And Holy Spirit said, I think you better figure out a way to do that song. And so anyway, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we love our worship team. And, and so we did it. We changed it. And I don't often do that, but I just felt it's such a simple song, such a simple phrase. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending. Oh. Most people hope for an instant transformation, but you know what? That's not how God works. Maybe at times, when I got saved, a lot of things fell off me. The blinders came off, 31 years old. This is life. But he's had to work with me all through the last 30-some years. And I haven't arrived yet. But there's one thing that I do. I keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, the author, the finisher. Because you know what? Jesus is the goal. You can't lose if you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Not people, not promotion, not money, not success, but Jesus. And those other things can happen. There's nothing wrong with them. But the problem is we're upside down in our pursuits because discipleship begins with beholding and God is revealed to us the best through Jesus Christ, his son. 2 Corinthians 4, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Do you see that? Jesus is the very image of God. The religious people of his day hated this. Jesus said this, I am my father of one. Before Abraham was I am, suggesting he was I am, God. They didn't like that. They didn't, they didn't mind worshiping a God that was far off, but they didn't want him real close. Come on, somebody. God's a little too close this morning. But you know what? Letting him close is the best part of a relationship with him. If we'll get past the terror, sometimes it can feel that way. But you know, Israel couldn't get past the terror, but Moses did. And Moses fellowship with the Lord and they said, just tell us what God says, and that's good enough for us. No, it's not. It's not God's best. It says Colossians 1.15 that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And the truth is, Jesus, by human standards, is not beautiful. Oh, I know we've got the Nazarene Jesus. <laughs> For all us white people. <laughs> Jesus was Jewish. Period. Now, there's nothing wrong with Nazarene Jesus. I mean, Jesus' image is tearing it up with Nazarene Jesus behind them. Everything they produce, everything they do, their whole service. So there's nothing wrong with it. But he didn't look like that. He doesn't look like that. And the truth is, Jesus is not beautiful because he's a beautiful human being. That may rock somebody's boat. He's beautiful because he's God in human form with all of God's attributes, his person, his person. Look at this, Isaiah 53, too. For he, speaking of Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should what? Desire him. Speaking of Messiah. Paul the Apostle said this, 1 Corinthians 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. You know what the beauty is of Christ? Imagine this. Paul the Apostle had an experience with God, but he was reflecting on the fact that Jesus was beaten. He was bruised. He was marred beyond recognition on a cross, can't breathe, can't stand up, bleeding out for you and me. He says, I don't want to know anything except Christ crucified. I'm going to tell you, a man on a cross, breathing his last breath, dying out and bleeding out is not beautiful. But that is the beauty of God. And he calls us to that image. Oh, Maybe not all the time. And certainly in our culture, we don't want to talk about dying for God. Oh, I'd die for God, would you? Much of the early church, the early apostles, most of them were crucified. 
for their beliefs. Some people around the world still are. Could be more of that as we move forward. I don't know. And I'm not saying tomorrow you're going to have to lay your life down for Jesus. But what if you did have to? Don't answer quickly. Just don't. I ponder this quite often, actually. And I'm like, God, I don't know if I could do it. I really don't know if I could watch a loved one suffer as you kill them right in front of me, and that happens. But you want to understand something, that beholding the God, that's part of his beauty, is that he's a God that will lay down his life for his friends. Oh, God had everything he needed, and Jesus had everything he needed. He had so much, there was a time the disciples thought, well, we could buy bread for this many, but where? We're, we're in the middle of nowhere. We can't buy bread. So Jesus provides from a little boy's lunch because it was necessary. He would have, I believe, had enough. He had a treasure. How many of you all got a treasure and followed you around? <laughs> Come on. And he would have had enough money to pay the temple tax, but... He says to Peter, go, the first fish, take out the money, it's enough. Just to show that he is not tied to the world's substance. He used it. He had people that supported him financially. People say, well, pastor, just believe God for it. I know, but there's this, there's this sometimes there's this problem. Ministries believe God for the money, but it's still in your wallet. I told you, we don't find Jesus beautiful. The early church, listen, they threw their money, they sold houses and lands and threw the money at the apostles' feet and said, look, we don't even want this. Some of us do that, most of us don't, not even close. And I'll tell you why, because we really don't find Jesus beautiful. What we find beautiful is our own image of what we think a successful life is, and if some antagonizing pastor tells you to give... That surely can't be God. And what we do is we spend a lot of our life rebuking the devil when God wants to just get through. Because it's like, it's like the rich young ruler. It's like the man who said, hey, I'll give everything. Jesus said, would you? I have nowhere to sleep tonight. He couldn't follow him. It's always that one thing. You ever notice that? It's that one thing. And I'm probably, I'm dancing on that one thing right now for a lot of us. I determined not to know anything except Christ crucified. Let me ask you a question. I think the question we need to ask ourselves is, if we feel distant from God, stay with me. If we feel distant from God, we need to ask ourselves if we've made Jesus the primary focus of our pursuit of God. Oh, there's many gods. Gods of this world. Gods of the wind. It's all idols. We, we know this, but we don't have them, remember? We don't, we don't live in those days. Yes, we do. But is Jesus my pursuit? Is Jesus my pursuit in life? To become like him, to know him, to draw near him. So I mentioned it's easy for us to accept the mercy of and free gift of salvation of God, and that's great, and we need to, because it is free. But we forget that God is a judge. He's a great king and a terrifying judge. That's the truth. Look at this. It says that Jesus commanded, all right, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained of God to be judge of the living and the dead. Oh, we don't want that, Jesus. Well, it's part of it. It's part of the package. Acts 17, part of our text, and then I want to read a little more in the same chapter, but we started this very series. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, those who have turned the world upside down. There you see the title. Have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and his... And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Let me say something. Everything in this world is declaring to you that everything else is king and Jesus isn't. Say upside down. Upside down. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands 
Commands. Same, this is the same, same passage of Scripture. Verses, I should say, same chapter. Commands everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he ordained. He has given assurance to all of us by raising him from the dead. And we cannot be fully disciples until we know every aspect of Jesus. If he's calling me into a relationship to become like him, the Bible says that we'll know him when we see him because we'll see him as he truly is because we become like him. That's what John said. The Pharisees, the religious people of Jesus' time, they knew the word of God. And we'll see in a moment that the word of God is one way he reveals himself to us. But they didn't recognize him. They didn't love him. And I think some Christians in our culture don't recognize Jesus. And so we seek this image instant, this image constantly that we think is Jesus. All right. Real quickly in the next few minutes, ways that God reveals himself. Number one, the spirit of God. Look at this, John 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus speaking, it is to your advantage I go away. For I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. Somebody say all truth. all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority for whatever he hears. He will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me and he will take of what is mine. This is a great promise. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Listen to this. All things the Father, somebody say all. All things the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. All things available to Jesus are available to us. If he saved us, Romans 8, 32, by Jesus, won't he also give us all things? But the thing is, we don't want the process. We just want the all things. It's what happens when some teenagers become teenagers. They want all the freedom of adulthood, but they don't want to grow up. Come on, somebody, help me out. A couple of you youth still in here. All right, so. Go Detroit Lions. All right. I'd be wearing a Michigan hat today after that last night's game, too. You know. I didn't stay up and watch it. It's too late for me on a Saturday night. So the Spirit reveals all things that are Jesus. So listen, so many churches don't believe that there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe that. The Bible teaches it. I don't have time to go into it in detail this morning. Say, so what does that mean while speaking other tongues? I hope so, but maybe not. And if you don't, that's okay. If you ask for the Spirit of God, Jesus said, if you ask for a fish, you won't get a scorpion. You're going to get what you ask for. But asking God to bless you with the fullness of his spirit so you can start to know him. And then allow the spirit of God, which is contrary to the way my mind thinks, to start to show me Jesus. Slowing down, settling my mind, taking time, reading his word. That's another way we'll see in a moment. So spirit's number one. Realizing that God's spirit, which is completely upside down or right side up, really, with what I think in the natural. So he'll speak to us. See, we need prophetic utterances. We need words of wisdom, words of knowledge, all these gifts of the Spirit, which are so essential. We can hear brothers and sisters. We can hear God through preaching of the Word like today. But it's the Spirit of God that communicates to us. We may all hear the words I'm speaking, but I guarantee you, each one of us, the Spirit is speaking something that's specific to us while I speak right now. Some people say, well, no, we just need prophecy. No, you don't want to discipline yourself, and you don't find the Word of God beautiful. See, if we're just reading the Word of God to find something we can post on Facebook, or my God meets all my needs according to His riches and glory through Christ Jesus, amen. <laughs> well, yeah, but Paul said, I know what I have a lot and nothing. But that's why I can say that. Because he had been through the process of a lot and nothing. (laughs) 
He speaks to us in the context of prayer. We don't slow down enough for that one. We'll talk more about some of these things as we, we have our fast coming up, 21 days of fasting and prayer. I hope you'll join us. It's called Seek. It's right on the front page of our website. It starts next Sunday. I meant to say it's up front. I forgot. Sorry. Maybe you've never fasted. It's okay. Start slow. Give up one meal. Give up a, a favorite food. I don't know. Do something, but then seek God. That's what it's all about, seeking Him. We're going to do it as a community of believers for 21 days. There's helps there. If you've never fasted, it'll show you what to do. You can adjust your, your meals and a diet and whatever. And It's more than a diet because we're fasting. Jesus said there's three things, Matthew 6, that all Christians will do. And I'll talk more about this uh, even next week. We'll kick it off next Sunday. He said Christians, all Christians should do this. Fast, pray, and give. <laughs> give? I don't have anything to give. Yes, you do. It's just what you have you don't want to give. And God will speak to us. If we, if we really ask him to speak, God will speak to you. But let me ask you this. Because here's the question. Do I really want to hear what he wants to say? Now, we, we're more than willing to hear what we want him to say, but do we really want to hear what he wants to say? I love you, Tony, but eh, shouldn't have done this. I didn't, I didn't like that. Or sometimes you just say, I don't like that in me, Lord. Lord, say, so, yeah, I don't either. But I love you. You're my son. I give my life for you. I have given my life for you. Oh, thank you. I'd do it again. Thank you, Lord. Even in, your, in my, even in my perfection, yes. See, God, <laughs> Trish has not loved me for 36 years because I'm perfect. <laughs> I'm close. But I am not there. And that's just, that's just, you know, in the context of a marriage. How much more with Christ? We behold God through his word. Look at this, John 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was, with, with, the word was bleh, with God, and the word was God. Do you see that? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. And the Father himself, John 5, who sent me has testified to me, you have neither heard his voice, he's speaking to the religious people at this time, this is Jesus, voice at any time, nor has seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scripture, so you can read the scripture and not know Jesus. You think you have eternal life, but these are the things which testify to me. Again, they didn't recognize Jesus because they didn't love Jesus. They, they didn't mind a God far off that met their needs. Again, that's what religion does. They want, didn't want God close who challenged them, said, you think you're righteous? Every thought you think towards a woman lustfully is adultery. And there were other times he challenged those who thought they had it figured out. If we don't discover God in his word, we miss the ultimate purpose of his word. And yet we don't, we don't read the word. And here's the thing. No one has ever had as much of the word as we do. No one. It's so available. We can get up. Oh, I better make sure I post something on Facebook. Make people think I read my Bible this morning. Oh, there's, that's a good one. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's so easy. I must have gone long. Thanks, guys. It's not, it wasn't my fault. Say this. It wasn't me. Somebody say that. It wasn't me. I'm going to move through this, I promise. Hmm. I have to go fast now. Thanks, children's ministry. I went three minutes long. All right, no. <laughs> Stay with me real quickly. The prophets of old didn't have what we have as far as the compilation of the Bible, the Word of God. Okay. They didn't. The disciples didn't have it. 
the, the reformers didn't have it. Some of the reformers, they were trying to get back to the word of God because they had drifted off, but they didn't have what you and I have right now available. Somebody said this, and I believe it to be true. The digital revolution is not about Netflix, Facebook, and YouTube. It's about free access to the word of God. Free access to the word of God. We are, cannot, we are not, in this generation, you will not stand before God and say, well, I didn't know what your word said. Ugh. Depart from me, I never knew you because we know him by his word, but we didn't take time. Well, I can't read, Pastor. Then listen to it. We have so, there is no excuse. There is no excuse for not hearing God's word if we want it. Problem is we really don't want it. And then finally we behold God in song. Spirit, the word, there's other ways, but those are primary. The songs that we sing, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, what's the conclusion? I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. Paul the Apostle, the other apostles, they lived this way. It was part of the Apostles' doctrine, and they taught it. Paul the Apostle gave instruction to the church of Ephesus. He said in chapter 5, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, and make melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord. Do you know that you and I, by singing songs, behold Jesus? Through the Spirit, through the Word, through singing songs. And some people think, well, that worship time, that's just something, it's a preliminary before we get to the Word. And then we fall asleep during the preaching. Stay home, I guess. I don't know. And I know, sitting out there, it, you know, I'm going long. I'm five minutes long now. I know that. But anyway, that's what the Bible teaches. And there's so much of the Bible about song. I don't have time because we have one more important thing this morning. But here's the bottom line. Do I find Jesus beautiful? Do I find him beautiful enough to lose my life that I can find it? Not about being perfect. You'll never get there. So don't even try. But it's about my pursuit. My pursuit of the one that I say that I love, the one who loves me and gave his life for me. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.